first of all, thanks for inviting me. Wow, what a venue uh, and what a, what a showing of people who are interested in this topic. It's fantastic to see. We're almost at a year now anniversary of the release of ChatGPT 3.5. Uh, by OpenAI, and we have also just gone through, for those of you who love tech drama, a really fun few days. Somebody posted on LinkedIn a few days ago asking, is, uh, is OpenAI the new Kardashians? And I thought, that's pretty much perfect, isn't it? And for those of us who watch it very closely, we were just on our phones all weekend. It kind of reminded me of last Christmas where all of you were probably having a nice time and I was reading my phone because it was mayhem on the AI front uh, last December uh, for reasons I'll go into. Uh, I'm also going to probably react to a few things I've already heard here this morning, in particular from Damien. Thank you, Damien. Uh, a few things that really made, uh, caught my eye. I often, I often mention Jeff Hinton in talks, not this particular one, but he's someone who comes up a lot, who famously uh, resigned from Google a few months ago, kind of in protest over, over what was happening with AI, despite being the godfather and the person who invented much of this technology. Uh, but I thought that his name coming up today and also what's happened with Sam Altman over the weekend was very interesting because there's actually two sides to this debate going on about AI safety. Uh, and really what's happened in the last few days is a bit of a face-off between the so-called accelerationists, speaks for itself, they want to accelerate towards AGI, artificial general intelligence, and the, the more safety, uh, risk averse uh, community. So I'm an educator, so I'm going to say this from a position of being an educator, but we have the sad uh, kind of reputation, I suppose, for actually being laggards on this front. And for unfortunately being a little bit conservative when it comes to experimenting with technology. Now that's not me speaking as me, that's me speaking about the research. The wonderful thing is a year after the release of GPT 3.5, here we are. So now we're really paying attention and now we're really engaged. Whether that comes from a position of excitement or a position of worry, I'm just happy you're here. So that's the main thing for me. So what I'm going to do in the next 50 minutes, hour or so is go quite quickly for the first 30 minutes, 20, 30 minutes or so. Don't worry about taking notes, it's a lot of images. Uh, I have a lot of links in the bottom of my slides that always take you to a website where you can see more. And at the risk of sounding terribly social media-ish, I have a YouTube channel with a whole bunch of videos and talks I've already given since January of 2023, where you can follow up and watch more detailed content on a lot of the things I cover. And I'm also fairly active on LinkedIn of all places. I don't use Twitter. I never have, never had to leave X. Thankfully, it was never an issue for me. But LinkedIn, for those of you who are not on it, has become a really interesting community for educators of all things. There's a lot going on there in that space in terms of teachers sharing their practice. Uh, so check it out. If you're not on there, it might actually be a reason to go on social media if you're not on LinkedIn already. So, and I swear I don't work for them. That's just my, that's my little plug. I found it quite useful. Right, with that in mind, here we are, I've named this optimistically generative futures because I think this is really where we are. Uh, we are now at a point where we have generative AI uh, integrated into our work, our lives, our play, our tools, our apps, and it really is going to, uh, to a huge extent, determine the way we live in the future. Uh, and the question now is, how do we want to be involved in that? And I, and I would say um, one kind of, um, edit I would make to the, to the talk about AI and its impact on education is I'm actually more less interested on in the impact of AI on learning, techn learning and teaching and assessment, but actually how can we leverage it? So I would like to change the conversation from how is it impacting us to how can we take it and use it as a tool ourselves? How are we going to use it to enable where we want to go with education as opposed to being acted upon? So just a slight change in, in, in verb there, but I think an important one in terms of the message we want to send. So I always start with this one. This is four years old now, this article uh, that came out from the Online Learning Journal by Anthony Picciano. And I always start with this because not just the quote itself, but the title of the article. Because really what he was worried about even four years ago was that AI would mean the Academy's loss of purpose. And in this article, he really summarizes the so-called existential threat that many educators feel as a result of generative AI entering the scene. But the important point for us is that we're just at the beginning. So if you think the last year has been a wild ride, and it has, and the last weekend in particular, it's not stopping anytime soon. So it is really wonderful that everybody is here because these technologies are about to, as I said, become more and more part of our lives. 
a very quick review of the year, and I'm going to go through some of these uh, tools and developments in more detail as I go on. But just to give you a quick overview first, this is the year of innovation. Uh, as I say, dates are not exact. This is a little bit for effect. So if you correct me on a date or two, I will stand corrected. Uh, and you'll notice that I put a little caveat at the end about Sam Altman because I really wasn't sure even yesterday evening what the, the status was going to be. But as of today, yes, he's still, he does work for Microsoft. Very interestingly, I'll talk about this in a later slide, they now have a new interim CEO, so they're on their second interim CEO since last Friday, and their new interim CEO is Emmett Shear, who's the former CEO of Twitch TV. And we'll talk about that a little bit later and what that might mean for OpenAI if you're interested. So we started the year, uh, essentially, with ChatGPT 3.5. Uh, and we went then through a series of developments over those months, which I found really interesting in terms of watching what was going on in industry, tech industry, and what was going on in education, because my background is in both. I started my academic career working in online learning, creating online courses in 1999 in Canada. I had just returned from Europe. I had a master's degree in European studies, and they asked me to create the first online courses in, in European studies for this university in Canada because I had the strange honor of being the only subject matter expert <laughs> and the only learning designer at the same time. So I did both. I created the courses, then I started teaching the courses, and that's actually what brought me to do a PhD, then become a professor and do all of that stuff. But I started in digital education. And for the last 23 years, I've gone in and out of higher education. I've worked in ed tech, I've worked in corporate ed tech, and I've worked for two startups. So I like to think I understand a little bit about what people are feeling on both sides, the pain and the joy. I really feel the pain and the worry that educators are feeling, but I also really see the opportunity that ed tech presents. And I really get nervous when I hear some of the negativity coming from certain circles. Actually, strangely, more in higher education, I've noticed, than in primary, secondary lately. So that's something just to note. Um, but I worry when I, hear, I, when I hear too much kind of naysaying because I think really this is our technology to leverage and use for ourselves. But I found it really fascinating that the two curves that we see a lot of in the last few months, on the one hand, you've got the hype curve, the Gartner hype curve talking about Gen AI and what was going to happen over 2023. This was published in J July 2023. And on the right, you'll probably recognize that. That is the grief curve uh, created by Elizabeth Kubler-Ross. So this curve is really uh, meant to depict what happens when you go through a period of loss and mourning and how you deal with it. And I thought, given that quote from Anthony Picciano, his article in the Online Learning Journal, his talk about the existential crisis, it really made me think this is what education has been going through for the last year or so. And it really was. So as I said, I didn't really have much of a Christmas last year. I was watching the news. Hopefully you had a better holiday than I did. I was watching people freak out collectively. And it started the day after ChatGPT 3.5 was released on November 30th, and it escalated until in January when people came back to school, they were really collectively freaking out about GPT 3.5. And these are all actual headlines taken from articles, uh, newspaper articles, academic articles, uh, things that were coming up in the media about what GPT might do. And it was all about GPT 3.5 at that point, and it was all about text generation. And we're going to move on from that quite quickly as well. Second stage uh, in the grief curve, anger and bargaining. And this is when we saw the growth in detectors, the AI detectors that suddenly became everybody's favorite tool. And we all decided that we were going to break the machine, and we were going to outsmart AI, and we were going to detect when people used it. Well, surprisingly, innovation being what innovation is, that didn't last very long. And we had a series of detectors that kind of rose and fall, fell and came onto the landscape. And each time those detectors appeared, GPT-0 is just one of them. Another tool will come along that showed how to beat the detector. And probably my favorite is this one here on the right, conch.ai. And I don't have it in the screenshot, but one of their taglines is that they will basically fix your essay or your written work until it is AI undetectable by an AI detector. So how, how perfect is this? It is the perfect picture of innovation and then trying to stop it and then more innovation. And we're seeing it, of course, as well in the bigger discussion, innovation, regulation. How do we balance the two? These are really part of this kind of uh, this cycle of innovation. Those of you who are economists who follow entrepreneurial studies, you'll be familiar with the theory of creative destruction. Joseph Schumpeter, who really talks about this idea that when we have waves of innovation, the dynamic is one of creative destruction. Something is created, something is destroyed. And that is literally what we are going through right now. Things are being created, things are being destroyed. That's part of the dynamic. 
stage three, depression. This was about the summer. By the summer, we got to the point where there was enough research on detectors to show that they didn't work. And everybody who had this lovely safety security blanket called an AI detector had to go, oh dear, now what? All of those so-called chief cheating students, which for the record, that was a that was a narrative I really objected to because I thought, what does that say about our relational approach to teaching? What does that say about our humanity and our relationship with our students? That we approach them firstly as a position of, from a position of mistrust, would-be cheaters, as opposed to students who come into your classroom ready to learn and grow. So I didn't like the narrative from the beginning, and I was honestly not surprised when this happened. In about June, July, Vanderbilt University was one of the first, but they put out a big, splashy kind of a, a news item on their website and they said we are taking down the AI detector from Turnitin because not only does it not work, it falsely identifies people for cheating who have not cheated and probably very importantly for any school that has a, a large number of international students as we do in Manchester, it falsely and overwhelmingly identifies people whose language, first language is not English and that's because they tend to use a slightly more simplified uh, version of English. As you'll all know, if you've learned another language, this is just how it works. So serious problems with detectors leading to their removal. I didn't cry over that one. So acceptance. This is where I hope we are now. I'm not sure we're quite there, but I think we're there, hence the question mark. And I note that we're there because I have seen various events like this, but also international guidance emerging, conferences happening, governments stepping up, the AI Safety Summit in the UK, the executive order from Biden, uh, obviously, the EU AI, AI Act, that's a tough one to say, the EU AI Act has been underway for years and is now getting closer to being passed. And the Asian countries are getting ready to issue a statement in January as well. So we have groups of international areas now of countries and governments that are getting together and are finally acting on AI. So schools are not the only ones who were behind. Don't worry. Governments are also just picking up now and getting going on this. So here we are. Essentially, that was it, a decade in a year. We started, as I said, really it started in December, but for me, things started in March. March was when GPT-3, sorry, GPT-4 was released. And for me, in terms of the way it's going to change education, this is where things really get interesting. Because for the first three months of GPT-3.5, it was all talk about text generation and essays and cheating. But once this happened, we catapulted through in terms of capabilities. Because GPT-4 was able to pass all the standardized tests that GPT-3.5 hadn't done so well as at before, but it also had much more in terms of capability. It had an app store, which they call plugins, which gave us, gives us still to this day, um, access to hundreds, if not thousands of apps uh, by choosing them in the plugin store. And it also had personalization, uh, comes a little bit further down the road where you can save your prompt so you don't have to write it every time. And very importantly, it had something called Code Interpreter, which has since been renamed Advanced Data Analysis because that's actually what it is. I don't know who named it Code Interpreter. But one of the first industries to be disrupted and upset by GPT-4 in particular was computer science. It was programmers, and that might surprise you, but that happened because all of the programmers and the developers who used to go to a website called Stack Overflow to check their code, they were all going to AI instead. And Stack Overflow plummeted. Now Stack Overflow has since added AI into their website and they've gotten on board like many other uh, platforms have. But in those early days, there was a real shock in even computer science. So just to say, this is not just humanities, social sciences, text-based disciplines. This is across the board and very much uh, computer science as well. From there, and this is just to make the point that it's not just GPT, even though I'm talking a lot about GPT. There are many LLMs, large language models, and there are many chatbots built on top of those various LLMs. Two of the ones I really like are up here on the screen. Perplexity, which is the first one really to make news because of the fact that it was linked to the web, and also it gives you follow-up questions, so it was fantastic for research. So you could put in a question, and it would give you the citations, and it would give you follow-up questions. So this is one of the favorites right now for educators, and I think for good reason. They have just recently in the last month also launched two chatbots, which I'll mention later on in my talk. Um, large context windows, what on earth is that, a context window? Essentially, the context window is the bit that you enter your prompt into. And with Claude, now Claude 2, which is owned by a company called Anthropic, which interestingly, side fact, 
The CEO of Anthropic was also offered the job of Sam Altman's last weekend, but he turned it down because he's a competitor. Just a little bit of nugget there. But Anthropic is getting an awful lot of news these days because they, first of all, made the news for their giant context window. Their context window was 100,000 um, tokens large size, however you say it. Essentially, in normal speak, it was the equivalent to being able to enter a novel the length of The Great Gatsby. Think about that for a second. It's not just you sitting there entering a prompt, how do I do this? How do I create a test on this? How do I write an essay on this? You could actually input an entire book and then ask questions about it. So that, combined with web interaction, combined with follow-up questions, starts to show you how things are really, uh, the capabilities are really growing quite quickly. I just wanted to show you this to make the point that GPT got a lot of coverage in September for being multimodal. BARD was multimodal months ago months ago. So I was in Ireland this summer, staying with my parents for a little while, having a little holiday, walking through the woods, and I saw this picture of a fairy door on a tree <laughs> in Roscommon. And I thought, well, that's interesting. I'm going to try out Bard's multimodal capabilities. So I just said, tell me about that picture. And it came out with a lovely story about fairy doors and what it might signify and what it means in terms of Irish culture, etc., etc. Did a pretty good job. The only place where it fell down was that I identified it as County Kerry instead of Roscommon. So apparently Kerry is more closely associated with fairy doors than Roscommon. You can make of that what you will. Um, Bard also now has extensions, and that is simply Google's name for plugins. So that just means that Bard and all of the, these capabilities can now be added as an extension if you use Google Workspace or any of those into your system, and it can interact with your emails, with your photos, with whatever you like. Interestingly, because Google also has been, I would say in the last year, a lot more safety focused and a lot more careful about the way they position their tools when they put them out there. They always say BARD is an experiment. Be careful with it. Don't trust it. They put it kind of front and center. OpenAI has been less that way, I've noticed. So BARD there, you'll see on the right, for example, I asked BARD a question. I'm endlessly fascinated by Elon Musk, I have to say. I don't know, it's a weird, sick kind of thing because he's so much in the news these days. And also his, his former partner, Grimes, is a Canadian musician who made headlines a few months ago for being one of the first people to step up and say that she wanted to help AI music trained, uh, make AI music trained on her voice and that she was willing to, to, to participate in that. So I came back and I, I had read about the names of their, their kids and I just thought, just for fun, I'll just put that in. Why on earth did they name their kid Techno Mechanicus? because it is an odd choice, isn't it? Uh, we thought that Kanye West had the world beat on weird names, but apparently uh, Grimes and Elon really went even further. And Bard came back with three different versions. And interestingly, it color codes the response to give you basically an indication of how much you can trust it. Green for go, obviously orange for take this with a little bit more of a grain of salt. So you can see again how the capabilities are becoming more and more advanced. So by about the summer, this is where we're at. Now, for those of you who want to follow someone who does some really interesting experiments, not always as applicable to primary, secondary education, but really interesting for people who are interested in innovation, entrepreneurialism, etc. This guy here, Ethan Mollock is his name. He's a professor of uh, entrepreneurship at the Wharton School in Pennsylvania. He has a Substack blog called One Useful Thing. I always include a link to his blog. He is phenomenal. He has been doing experiments since day one and he shares them all with everybody on LinkedIn, as I said, but also on Substack. So this is a screenshot from one of his blog posts in the summer where he basically summarized where we were at with the various types of chatbots and what they could do. So just a little bit of a useful summary there. So you think, okay, well, we're all right. We're, we're in acceptance now, we're in phase four. I can handle this, I can get my head around it. No, <laughs> we're not there yet at all. It's just gonna keep on going. So another thing I just wanted to let you know is, as I said, it's not just OpenAI's GPT. And it's not just Google Bard, and it's not just Perplexity, and it's not just Claude and Claude 2. Those are probably the most famous ones right now. There are, as Damien said, hundreds if not thousands of AI tools and apps out there right now. And these are two of the databases that I recommend. If you want to just go and put in a search, put in a filter, see what's there for educators, and have a look at both. The Rundown also has a blog, which is very useful, uh, and Futurepedia is another one that people look to. Now, this is not to say that you have to go and learn how to use all of these different tools, but just to be aware that that information is out there. And in fact, my rather large caveat to all of that is that what comes next with GPT-4 is now threatening to make a lot of this stuff redundant. And a lot of these early startups, the so-called wrapper startups, which I'll explain in a moment, might actually now be losing 
and might be on the way out. And a lot of the early stars in generative AI might actually be pretty bankrupt. And the most obvious one is, is Jasper AI. I'm going to show you that one in a moment. Before I go to that, let me just do a little bit of a detour. Another really important area, and I think this is what caught the news, and this is probably what made people really worried, justifiably so, was what was happening in synthetic media. So digital media is one thing, digital, uh, digital education, digital everything, but we are now really moving into a post-digital era. We are into, and when it comes to media, we are moving into the synthetic media era. And by that, I mean it is created with or by AI. So as I said a minute ago, we have AI-generated music. We also have the famous one, of course. I'm sure many of you seen The Pope in the Puffy. That came out in March, April or so. I always laughed at people who thought this was real because I don't know about you, but The Pope did not strike me as someone who's going to buy a Balenciaga Puffy. But hey, maybe he's become a fashion icon, but it wasn't real. Of course, it was just made up. But I think it really put it on the main stage, main screen for people quite um, dramatically that this is what AI generated images could do. They could fake us out to this degree. And from there, it just went on. We had, you know, uh, Van Gogh's Starry Night with a New York skyline. And from there, we have more creative and very impressive and workplace uh, applicable applications. And these are all screenshots from the websites, okay? So everything you need to do, anything you want, right? Creative reality, advancing creativity with artificial intelligence. That's Runway, one of the big names in, um, in media production using AI. Websites, you can create a website instantly with a prompt. It's never actually instant. These demos and these websites always over promise and under deliver to a point. But even if you go there and you visit it and you decide that it is disappointing, like my AI generated image of a female professor going to work, this is me, apparently. So I look a little bit like someone from Avatar. But you know, they are going to get better. That's what's happening is they're improving all the time. So this is the kind of thing that you can do. And in fact, now it has, it has improved to the point which you do not actually need to enter text anymore to edit your images. So you can do something like those two images on the bottom of the lion and the mountain. You can just get your cursor and pull it up to make the mountain higher or to open the lion's mouth. You don't even have to type anything anymore. You can literally edit by using so something called drag gun. That's the name of the technology. So you have companies like Studio DID, you have Runway, you have uh, various others that are all basically creating this synthetic media. And of course, this got an awful lot of publicity and it hit the news this summer because of the WGA writer strike in America. And I'm sure many of you noticed that those writers were on strike partly because of the use of AI in, video, in uh, media production, in film production. Now that dispute has just been resolved in the last two weeks or so. Uh, but there was a lot, it was, I think it was the longest strike in history for those Hollywood, Hollywood writers. And it was basically about the degree to which those writers would agree to either sit around a table, uh, you know, creatively thinking, with AI, or whether or not, in, in a very uh, disturbing case, you could take someone's likeness and then use AI to replicate it and use it forever in other films, which of course they, they didn't want. So there was a lot going on there and I've, again, sorry, terrible plug, but if you are interested in creative industries, there is a talk on creative industries on that YouTube channel. So you can have a look at that if you want to. Here are some examples though of more useful applications for us. The one that I'm really, really impressed by is this one by Eleven Labs. So Eleven Labs is a, a platform or a company that allows you to do translation of videos in any, any language, not any, but several languages at this point. And this is the one, the demo that they had on their website for a while, David Attenborough uh, giving a talk in English, and then you could choose German, French, Spanish, Portuguese, whatever, and it would instantly switch to another language. Think about the potential for that for education. Think about the potential for that for international students for breaking down physical, geographic, and linguistic barriers. It's mind-blowing when you think about it. Think about it for your own work, for the videos you might want to create for your students. So the fact that we now have simultaneous, almost simultaneous translation is, is, is I think, an incredible one for accessibility. So I'm really excited by that myself. Um, the less exciting, but slightly creepy, but also really interesting ones are examples like the Snapchat influencer, Carolyn, who has an AI self. Um, and we mock these, but can I just tell you that this is the fastest growing area in AI, is AI companions. So people don't talk about it that much, but AI companions, maybe not the fastest, but one of the fastest growing areas in generative AI, because we also have an epidemic of loneliness, of anxiety, of students who are nervous in higher education anyway. I don't know if they have this option in primary and secondary, but to just not come to class. We have a problem with students not showing up 
because they're too nervous, they're too anxious, they don't want to be in a room with real people. And now some of this dates to COVID and the pandemic, but some of it is just a wider issue. And some experts are saying that actually these companions might serve a good purpose in terms of helping some of those students, helping some of those people that are dealing with loneliness and anxiety. So I'll just leave that there for you to ponder. The silly ones on the right I've included because, first of all, I think that the, the idea of being able to record a relative's voice and then have that relative live on after they have passed is something that just freaks me out a little bit. But for some people, again, might be quite useful for closure if you didn't get a chance to say goodbye, for example. But as the company said, this is the next step in the human quest for immortality where we can actually have a loved one carry on even after they have left this earth in an app called I think it's called here and after. I can't see it from here, but I think it says here and after. And then the reason I left these two up here is because this is Twitch TV. So remember I mentioned Sam Altman is gone now. He's in Microsoft. And now the interim CEO at OpenAI. And then remember, the board fired Sam because they were worried about safety and acceleration. They now have an interim CEO who was the former CEO of Twitch.tv. Now, I don't know how many of you have been on Twitch TV, but it's a pretty crazy place to be sometimes. Uh, so, for example, you have a nonstop uh, uh, 24 hours, seven days a week uh, debate between AI Trump and AI Biden, uh, which is profane and rude. And I'll warn you, it should really come with a warning. So I'm giving you the warning. If you go to Twitch TV and you have a look at AI Trump and Biden, they basically just curse each other out all the time. But it's very entertaining for about a minute. Then it stops being entertaining and it just gets a bit icky. Uh, so then my kind of joke is that then you can go to another channel on Twitch TV, you can switch over to AI Jesus, where you can enter your problem, you can ask for, I don't know, forgiveness for your sins, and AI Jesus will give you advice based on what you've put in. They're silly, right? They're silly, but they're there, they're popular, people are watching them, and this is now the new interim CEO at OpenAI. So just leave that there with you for to ponder. Hi there. Welcome to this talk on generative AI and education. If you're a teacher, you're going to find this super interesting. Are you ready to jump in? Give me a show of hands. Show of hands. Right. Listen, I just left that in there because this took me the grand total of three seconds. I went to the DID site, I chose a pre-existing avatar and I typed those words and that's what came up. I've done nothing else. Absolutely nothing else. Now, the quality is not great. She's a bit wooden. It's a bit weird, but it's not bad when you consider the amount of time that it took me to create it. And when you think again about what you might be able to do with lesson content, with delivery, you think about that in multiple languages, there's an awful lot we can think about in terms of digital education and delivery, right? So those, the AI avatar space, simultaneous translation, all of that is really, really interesting, I think, in terms of what it could do for us. These are some of the bots and the friends that are also on the landscape. Um, now, many of these will be familiar. If any of you have teenagers, and of course you all work in schools, so you'll know this, Snapchat. Snapchat was the one that was in the news probably first for um, not just integrating an AI body, but actually pinning it to the home screen. So when you open Snapchat on your phone, the AI body comes up first. And interestingly, the people who used it, those same teenagers said, we don't want this. They actually objected to it and they said this is an invasion of our privacy. So funnily enough, we sometimes say, you know, this generation, they need to be taught how to deal with AI risks and safety. They already know. <laughs> they already know. They recognize. We have to remind them. We have to show them how to use it purposely. But they are actually quite aware of some of, uh, of, some of the risks and they are not happy when AI invades their privacy in the way that it did in this case. So just something to note. And I think the company noted it as well. A few more, uh, Inflection AI created Pi. Uh, Inflection AI was created by the co-founder of LinkedIn. The other thing you should just be aware, when you look at this tech space, there's about five or six people and they're everywhere. Reid Hoffman, the head of Inflection AI, OpenAI, Google, they're like a little, they're a little club that all worked together in various places and now they've gone off in all kinds of directions, but they all know each other. And a lot of these bots are the products of companies that already exist. So that's from the LinkedIn founder, Poe, the one on the bottom right, is from Quora, the crowdsourcing information platform. Often if you've got a question, you put it in Quora, Quora will come up if you do a Google search or whatever internet search. Um, and of course, Khan Academy. I'm sure many of you have come across Khan Academy. Khan Academy itself, of course, has been around for a long time. It's one of the, the innovators in digital education, video-based learning, et cetera. Um, but they came out with their Conmigo uh, early in the year. 
very early in the year. And of course, I always say this wins for me, the marketing prize in terms of naming. I love it because those of you who speak Spanish will know that conmigo in Spanish means with me. So the whole idea behind this is you have a personalized tutor that is with you throughout your entire educational journey. Okay, so this is someone that students can go to, someone, uh, to ask questions about anything in their courses, get advice. If you want something more personal, friendly, less formal, hi, you can choose the tone. And maybe if you want something, another kind of flavor, you can go to Poe. So they all have different personalities, there I say. They're all trained in different ways to deliver different outputs. There are also, very interestingly now, there's growth in this area. And this is where I think there's a lot of potential for education. Obviously, the personalized chatbots can give you personalized feedback, can help with adaptive learning, all of that stuff. Group conversations, though. Again, character AI. A few months ago, people were not quite dismissing character AI, but there was a lot of kind of characterizing it as it's just entertainment. Character AI has received a lot of funding in the last month or so because people are starting to realize that this could actually also be very, very useful for educational purposes. So in Character AI, you can be a lowly history teacher like I was once upon a time, or you can talk to Abraham Lincoln or Socrates. Uh, and again, it has the usual kind of safety warning which says, you know, this is all made up, but still you can see how it might be useful in, in certain settings. The one that I really liked was this one. And again, none of these are necessarily me saying go and use or buy these products. I don't work for any of these companies, but I try all of these tools out myself. Uh, and I really liked this one, Circle Chat. Uh, I did this when I was heading to Spain a few months ago uh, and I was watching the Spanish elections and I was quite concerned by what I was seeing uh, in the, on the streets and what was happening in the narrative, you know, left wing versus right wing in Spain. And I was thinking, wow, given the history of that country, this is really interesting that they're voting for far right. The dictatorship's not that far in their history, you know. Uh, so I put in, you know, basically this, this prompt, you know, tell me a little bit about how I should interpret what's going on in the elections given Spain, Spain's history. And that's all I did. I didn't create these other characters. The bot did it for me. So it came up with these different characters, gave them personalities, and it basically offered different perspectives. So think about it. If you use an LMS or you have any kind of online discussions where I have in higher ed, we have often we have courses where people do online discussions. Lately, my colleagues have been complaining that they think that their students are cheating by taking po their discussion posts from ChatGPT. And my question is always, well, of course they are. You know, what, what have you changed it? If, if you haven't changed anything, how can you expect them to do anything else? So when I look at something like this and I think there is a, there is a tool where we could have an interactive, dynamic conversation with a group. It could include some actual humans. It could all be uh, avatars. It's up to you. But that's, a, that's a, an example of a tool where you can integrate this kind of group conversation to talk about something in a class. Now, I'm not going to go on about this uh, in any depth, but just to say that, of course, if you weren't aware, it's now pilot season, right? There are co-pilots in everything. Google released uh, Duet uh, a short time ago, which is Google's version of Microsoft Copilot. And all that means is that the kinds of workplace efficiencies that John mentioned in terms of education management, streamlining things like content, production, emails, meeting notes, et cetera, you can do all this now because you'll have Copilot integrated into your, into your uh, platform. So. We use Microsoft products at my university, and that means that now whenever I open up an email, I get a prompt asking if I want to have some help from AI, for example. If I go to a meeting on various platforms, it offers me a chance to have an AI bot come with me. Often it's Otter, uh, and that, that AI bot will record the meeting and then will uh, not just share meeting notes, but also actions from the notes for you afterwards. So really, really interesting in terms of efficiency, and yes, cutting down some of the time that we have historically spent on administrative tasks. So if you weren't already feeling overwhelmed, since September it has really skyrocketed yet again. And honestly, I feel like I'm just talking in very exaggerated terms a lot. But the truth is, if this had happened in another context, our minds would have been blown. But I think we were so used to things happening over the last year that we took this with a bit of a grain of salt, which is, which is in itself very surprising. But in September, OpenAI released this, this uh, blurb on their website saying, ChatGPT can now see, hear, and speak. So now we have multi-sensory, multilingual uh, chatbots, where this, in this demo, the person on Twitter uploaded a photo of their bike and said, you know, I need help with this. You can read it yourselves there. And then GPT gives instructions on how to do it. And if that were not impressive enough, what they then did was they took a photograph of the toolbox they had to fix their bike, and they posted the, the photo and said, I don't know which tool to use. Can you tell me? And GPT looked at the photo, 
and said, you need that Alan wrench. So it was able to read the photograph and it was able to then give advice from there. Now that's just one demo example. I've seen much more interesting examples in the last couple of weeks. One that I love is from a, a university, UC Santa Cruz professor called Benjamin Breen, who's been using GPT-4 multimodal vision capability to analyze old documents for his history courses. So for example, he uploaded an 18th century Catalan medical manual and the GPT was able to read it and dissect it and give uh, feedback on it. He uploaded magazines from the 1930s uh, where they had all kinds of data in very kind of old fashioned format. And it instantly created a graph where it could show what the different users were, et cetera. And these, so it gave all the feedback in a very modern kind of a picture compared to the, the primary sources that he was using. So his take on that was, all of this, this vision, this capability, this multimodal capability is allowing us now to actually analyze primary sources in a way that we were never able to do before. So it's not just about teaching, even though I'm here to talk about teaching and teaching innovation and assessment and learning design, it's also about research. And for me, that's very important because I work at a research intensive university where, and in a lot of these research intensive universities, I think there is still a little, little, little bit of an idea that this doesn't quite affect us in the same way that it does those people who are more focused on teaching. It does. It affects all of us. And I would say particularly in cases like mine when we are where we do research led teaching. So it's really two sides of the same coin as far as I'm concerned. Teachers are innovating on the one hand, researchers are innovating on the other. We're all sharing practice and this is what we're seeing from people. So last but not least in terms of innovations, if you're feeling a little bit blown away, I don't blame you, but this happened um, just before Sam got fired. So OpenAI held uh, Dev Day on November 6th or 7th, whatever the Monday was, and they, they announced a whole slew of, um, of exciting new things. And again, the word on the street is this might've been what got Sam fired. Uh, that he was a little bit too eager and a little bit too enthusiastic about releasing these GPTs, as they were called, into the public arena. Probably the worst marketing, I would say, calling them GPTs, because we're already getting our heads around GPT-4, GPT-3.5. To call an entirely different thing a GPT, I think you'll agree, is a little bit confusing. Basically, what GPTs are, are personalized bots that you can train yourself by entering the prompt that you would normally do if you have a personalized GPT, and you can save the prompt and you can return to it. If you have a GPT, you can set up your own bot you can train it by adding your own documents or linking it to information on the web that you wanted to draw from, and then it will give feedback based on what the users are, are asking for. So my take on that is that these GPTs, they are, OpenAI positioned them really as proto-agents. We're almost at agent stage, and I'm going to get to that on the next slide. But it's really, from my perspective, this is not actually an agent. This is more about an assistant and about enabling us as individuals to create the closest thing to our own private LLM ourselves. And I would say for free, but it's not for free because you have to have a GPT-4 subscription for this which is 20 pounds a month. So that is another really important thing I just want to mention as I go through this crazy tour of what's happened. Everything to my mind that's happened since March is really important for educators and those all require a subscription. So JISC, the same body that John Anderson mentioned, JISC has did, a, did a, a presentation at the same conference I was at in Derry in September. And Sue Atwell, who's one of the leads on AI for JISC, she presented a summary of what it would cost a student per month to have a subscription to the basic tools that they need. So let's say GPT-4, let's say uh, one of the more advanced image bots, whatever, a little bit of an array, a, a research tool, and it came up as about 80 pounds a month. Now, 80 pounds a month is a lot to ask a student to pay for AI. But we are now at the point where we are facing basically a digital divide when it comes to AI as well. So this is something for school administrators, I think, to really think about, for government to really think about, because if we are actually going to provide equal access to AI tools, and if we are going to allow students to use these and us as educators to leverage their power, we actually need a subscription to some of these. So that's a tricky one. Now, the caveat to that is that you can access GPT-4 for free if you go through what used to be called Bing Chat and you select Creative Mode. There are three modes. If you select Creative Mode, you can use GPT-3. Bing Chat, just to make it more confusing, has recently been rebranded since Microsoft's event, the Ignite event just last week, uh, where now everything is called Copilot. So the names are changing, but basically we're moving along the same trajectory. This is a bot that I set up myself the day after they uh, released these because I wanted to test it out. Um, 
I'm a friendly expert in digital education and learning design. Uh, and basically, I was just seeing what it would do. Uh, so I uploaded an article that I wrote that's just a preprint. It's not copyright protected. It's on archive. And it's basically the ideas that I'm about to show you in the next few slides. And I thought, how cool would it be if I didn't have to go and give a talk, but people could take the ideas that I share in these talks and that I share in that article, and they could get feedback on how to design a curriculum, create an activity, create an assessment based on these principles. So that's what I did with that particular one. You can check it out there if you want if you have a subscription. Um, and if you want to see all of the thousands of them that are already out there now in the last two weeks, you can go to this website, uh, SuperTools, where they now have a GPT search function, where you can type in pretty much anything and there'll be a GPT for it. Okay, so that's the latest development. And as I said, Sam, when he came onto the stage at Dev Day for OpenAI, he made a big deal about these being proto-agents, which I think, quite frankly, is dangerous terminology. I think we can all agree that people are worried about agents, because when you hear the word agent, you're worried about AI taking over and destroying the world. That AI center quote that Damien shared, that quote was something that got a lot of press coverage. Right? And a lot of people signed those, those letters. The Future of Life Institute had a letter where hundreds of people signed it and said, we need to protect humanity. Of course we need to protect humanity. So we shouldn't be throwing about around terms like agent unless they're really agents. Really what they are right now are assistants. Assistants in your work, assistants in your teaching, assistants in your research. But we are heading that way. Now, uh, several months ago, there was a lot of talk about Agent GPT and another one called Baby GPT. Those are both AI agents. And basically what an AI agent is, it is a tool that doesn't basically uh, require you to enter a prompt, and instead you enter your end goal. So for a joke, I said, I'd like to transform education. So I put in, that is the goal. And what it did was it broke down what that would mean in terms of tasks, and then it went away and it linked to the various tools but it says where it's going. It shows you where it's going to do the work, and then it executes it task by task. And then it comes back and it says, I've finished the task for you. So what's important for you to know, for me as an educator, when I see something like that, I think, okay, the first thing I started telling people back in January was, we need to focus on learning as process rather than learning as output. Because if GPT can recreate your student's output in an essay, that's no longer good for assessment. You now need to think much more about stage by say, stage, formative learning, formative feedback, developmental work, things like that. But when I see something like this, I think to myself, OK, where are we going with that? Because if we're going to have agents that can actually complete tasks for us in the future, probably six months from now, I'm guessing, maybe a year, what does that do for final assignments? Uh, maybe upper year, probably not the levels you are worried about so much in this room, but when I think about the researchers at my university, and I think about the tasks that we're setting our PhD students, for example, that makes me question, how are a a agents going to affect research and this task that we might set them to complete a goal? All right, so just leave that with you just to, to think about. So mind the gap. I wanted to put this up there because I think it's pretty clear from what I've said, hopefully, that there is a gap between industry and education. And I think we all know that. We feel this in the room. And my worry is that the pace of change is such that a gap, you know, we're here today to try and close it, but that gap just, it keeps growing because the pace, the accelerationists are pushing it at this pace that we really need to be, you know, trying to catch up constantly. The actual truth is that if we stop development of AI right now, we have enough to work with for probably five or 10 years in education is the truth. We could work for the next five to 10 years on GPT-4 as it is now. That's the honest truth. And that's what we probably need to be focusing on for the next year or so, I would say. But for example, time, you know, it's top 100. These are all tech leaders. There were, I think, three professors on the, row, on the list and one woman really annoyed me. But that woman was Emily Bender, who is the one who wrote the article about st stochastic parrots that John referred to. So very, very pers uh, important person in terms of AI and the discussion around it. Mustafa Solomon, he's uh, part of Inflection AI, the maker of the Pi bot that I showed you. He basically argues that AI, because of what it's going to do in terms of synthetic biology, as well as generative AI, is going to change our world. And we are not ready. Not ready. It's a scary book, but a really good book. <laughs> I urge you to buy it and read it. Um, another really scary book and, and quite a startling one I found was this one by Stefan Papanici um, on learning futures. His book is very negative and he writes about higher education probably more so than, again, primary or secondary, but education. And 
it's a very critical narrative and he talks a lot. I say critical and, I, and I'm not exaggerating because he makes a lot of comparisons between what was happening during the Nazi er era and a lot of the origins of AI and where the uh, ideas about surveillance and control and some of these ideas came from, from that period in history. So a lot of it's quite dark, to be honest with you. Uh, and my own, to my own mind, I feel like it might be overly dark, but it's a good read to offset the other two. And then there's Gary Marcus. And if you follow this uh, field, you will know that Gary Marcus is very vocal. He's in the Jeff, Jeff Hinton uh, group now, really, but he was talking about the dangers of AI for years. He is very opposed to the way that we are speeding up large language uh, model development using neural networks. So again, you can geek out on that if you want, but that's a very good, easily, uh, easy to read book, a few years old now. So that's the picture really from, from big tech. It's really different from education and it's actually still quite different from ed tech. These are the things that are occupying tech's minds right now. And they're probably not things you're thinking about that much, I'm guessing. You're probably not thinking about the fact that your operating system is about to be a generative operating system. For example, you know, you're probably not all that aware of the partnerships and how they work, but they're important. So just be aware that they're there in the background. There's a big tech giant and a small startup everywhere you look right now. There's cloud wars, there's chip wars, there's competition for chips, there's competition for talent. There's a race happening in the background that's informing a lot of this. Um, there's also wearable AI. So a new company called Humane, which has been in the works for a couple of years, just put on uh, onto the market their new AI pin. Mixed reviews, to put it politely. Um, but the point is, it's coming. AI devices are coming. Whatever they look like, we're not sure. It might be a pendant, it might be a new AI iPhone. But if you think about your students now and how much they use their phones and how much you have to ask them to put their phones down or turn them off, or in my case, when they walk around campus and they're all like this, if they have AI on their devices, as they already do, GPT-4, GPT-3.5 was, I think, the most downloaded app on the iPhone store when it came out in May, June, whenever it was, um, they're already using them. They already have access. So yes, we have to be aware of things like age limits, but we also have to be realistic and understand that if you have a student or a child who has an iPhone or an Android, they can have those apps on, the, on that phone anyway. So we need to be aware of that kind of bigger picture, I think, as well. So where are we going with integration? Well. I think I've kind of alluded to this, but this is the reality. Where, ed, where big tech goes, ed tech follows. And I've seen this very, very clearly in the last nine months, 10 months or so. Um, that was a picture of the ed tech landscape back in January or so. It has grown dramatically since then. This is a picture of the machine learning AI landscape generally in about mid-year. And those both come from investment firms. Can't find anything else online. Those are the only things you can really find online from Reach Capital and another one. But what you can find online is Bloomberg's report on the fact that generative AI is set to be a massive market. And if you look at the investment in education, we are only at the start. So EdTech also knows where the money is. That's fine. I've worked in EdTech. That's fine. Everyone has to make a living. And the idea, though, is that we use the technology for our benefit and for our students' benefit. So we need to be involved in it. So when I say that, EdTech follows big tech. Here's an example. This is Jasper AI, the company that was already big news before the release of, of ChatGPT 3.5. And it's a so-called wrapper model. It's a little dismissive to call it that, but that's really what it is. It's the LLM base, and then the wrapper is like the template that you put around it. And then you put in your prompt or you choose your output, and it will generate what you need. Those were really big news about a year, year and a half ago. And Jasper got a ton of funding early in this kind of wave. Jasper is now in trouble and it's laying people off. And the reason that Jasper is laying people off is because GPT-4 has now integrated all of the capabilities that it offered. So all of those early startups, all of those people that I mentioned that would be on Futurepedia, the Rundown, all those databases, many of those companies are now going to be in trouble because the capabilities of generative AI are all being improved and it's the big tech companies that are integrating them into their products. So there's a whole other debate too going on about big tech, you know, consolidation in a few big companies versus the open, open tech movement. I don't have time to get into that, but it's a really interesting one as well. But here's what you're seeing in education. These are all rappers, okay? And to be clear, I have nothing against teachers making their lives easier. Absolutely nothing against using technology to alleviate some of the administrative burden. I think that's a wonderful thing. What I do not want is for teachers to be written out of the equation when they are creating their classroom 
materials. And what I want to really underline is that you can do this yourself. You just need to learn how to use the tools. You don't actually need a wrapper. So they're fine, they're there, use them if you want. But just be aware, you can do it yourself and I'm not sure how many of them are gonna last. E-learning generation, this one I love, knowledge. They said you could instantly automate e-learning. No, you can't. But what you can do is you can generate flip cards and quizzes. Another example of a tech company that overpromises and as of yet is not quite delivering, but will, but will. It's improving, okay? This is the one that the UK government just announced a two million in uh, funding. Rishi Sunak just announced this a few weeks ago. They've invested two million in this uh, Oak Schools project. And this is an interesting one to me because this is by educators for educators. So that's wonderful. And it needs that two million because it's not great yet, is the truth. But hopefully the more educators work on it, contribute to it, the better it will get. So these are the kind of initiatives I like to see but unfortunately, these are the kind of initiatives that are not quite up yet to the standard of the corporate ones. So we have that inequality and there's good reasons for it, but it's good to see that there's investment on this front because we need it. OK, and you can go and check all those out yourself as well. All the links are there. I mentioned Canmigo. Uh, again, I work in higher ed, so we have a learning management system. You usually have Blackboard or, or Canvas. Canvas is interesting because it has taken Canmigo and integrated it. So it has taken a very student-centered approach. It is concerned with student experience, personalization of learning, advice, feedback for students. Another example is Blackboard, which has gone another direction. And I would say they have gone more the direction of the wrappers. And what they're focused on is making life easier for teachers, for instructors. Again, both very worthy causes. So in this case, you can use generative AI, which is integrated into the learning management system to generate your course materials. And again, these are all wonderful, worthy uh, endeavors, make no mistake. Uh, but I think we need to be keeping an eye on them. And this is why. This is Tony Bates, and this is a few years old now as well. Uh, and he wrote this as part of an introduction to a special issue on the impact of generative AI in higher education. And he put out a call for papers and he got an astoundingly low number back. And the ones he got back were not very good. They got 26 papers. They decided that of those 26, only five were good enough to publish. And his reaction was, where are the educators? Where are they? Why are they not engaging with AI? Because he could see it coming. This is a man who worked in digital, digital education for 20 odd years. He's written 11 books on the topic. He's an expert. He knows where we're going with it. And he was wondering, why are educators not weighing in? The truth is they weren't engaging. They didn't really see it coming. We didn't necessarily see it coming. We weren't paying attention. We are now. And he literally says the tsunami is coming. And of course, we know the wave metaphor. You just can't get away from it. It's everywhere. And, and it's here. So what I'm saying is two approaches emerging. Um, and I'll give you the, I'll, I'll kind of fast forward to the, to the punchline. I think we need both. So I, I am a fan of helping teachers alleviate their administrative burden. I think this is wonderful, but I think we need to be aware that the automating, the wrappers, the content generators, the resource generators, they serve a certain purpose and they are limited in terms of the personalization, shall we say, that you can, you know, the way that you can use them. And on the other side, there's the student-centered side, which takes, frankly, a bit more work and a bit more professional development on your side. And it will take more work to learn how to use these tools in order to augment not your own individual capacity, but your students' capacity. Because I think this is where the promise is. This is where we want to be going. This is Education 4.0, which we've also been talking about for years. Education 4.0 is the model of education that Web 4.0 tools allows us to create and deliver. And it is defined by active learning, authentic assessments, right? personalized tutoring, adaptive, all of these wonderful words we hear so much about. We have the tools at our disposal to start creating that. What it does not list is content generation. And it, so it has its place, but I don't think that's the dream and the vision if I'm honest, you know? And I think we should aspire, as someone said already this morning, to, to be better, to do better than that. So here's how I think we should go, and it's not just me. UNESCO, in that same, the same group that, again, Damien, I believe, mentioned earlier, in a later publication in September, they issued uh, some guidance, and they continue to issue guidance. And again, on LinkedIn, the education lead 
he often posts his frameworks that he's working on and he invites teachers to feedback. So feel free, engage. It's your invitation to do that. And as you can see, really what they are saying is we don't need to write out the human, obviously, but what we really need is co-design. We need co-design and redesign of assessment. We need humans and AI together, and we need to redesign our assessments with what's going on in mind. Now, I have added a couple of caveats because I am a fan of the UNESCO guidance, but I also think it's a little bit limited, if I'm honest. I'm very honest. And that is because there is an assumption that assessment is static, and it's not. As I just alluded to, it's going to change, and it is changing. And also, this idea that we have these human skills on the one hand and these AI skills on the other, I don't think it's that simple, unfortunately. I don't believe that it's creativity, critical thinking, leadership, resilience, collaboration, those are all human, and AI can't do any of those. We know that AI has so-called creative capacity. It might not be the same as students or humans, but it has a certain kind of creative capacity. So the truth of the matter is AI is actually able to problem solve. AI is able to collaborate, those bots, etc. AI has a certain amount of creative capacity. So we need to be aware of the fact that the ground is shifting uh, and it is our best interests to become AI literate as fast as we all possibly can. So here's two links I'd like you to take with you when you leave today. These are not related to any big tech company. This is a consultant I know from Canada who does amazing work. And these two, uh, two this toolkit and this framework uh, are something I would really, really recommend every education leader look at. Um, okay, so AI competencies there. And last two minutes or so, I'm going to do a very quick flip through these because, as I said earlier, I've written on this. There's a link to the article. You're more than welcome to go and look at it, but I'm not going to take too much time to go into it because I think I've given you plenty to mull over. But I'll tell you, this is where I think we're going. I think that we're now at a point where we have a new type of hybrid learning, and it's not about online or face-to-face -face anymore. It's about human and AI. It's a different kind of hybrid, and it's us with and in this AI ecosystem of tools, using those tools to create a type of education that is different, this Education 4.0. And it's based on all of these learning approaches and theories. It's grounded in this idea of assessment as process rather than output. And it's really about this idea of collaboration. That means, as someone else said this morning, we can't all be experts in everything, but you need a team to help you. You can be your disciplinary expert, but you need a design expert, you need a technology expert, you need all of those people at the table to work on these designs together. SOTL is Scholarship of Teaching and Learning, so you need to have that informing what you're doing, and your educational development needs to intersect as well. So these are things to think about when you're planning. These are the pedagogies that I look to, the last two in particular, which are the internet age. Connectivism, which is all about students working in networks, being nodes in networks where knowledge resides. It's not just humans, but it's in digital assets and spaces as well. And generative learning theory. See, I didn't just make it up. <laughs> this has been around for a while as well. He doesn't call it generativism. That's my ism. But he says that students generate learning by doing this active learning, and they can generate their own. They can construct their own knowledge. So I think if we bring all that together, we can create that we can create that, that new type of learning. And I'm going to flip through quite quickly just to show you when you're planning AI at every stage. You're doing your design. You're doing constructive alignment. You're starting with the end in mind. All of those things you all know, they're good practice in teaching and learning. Digital pedagogy using active learning. This is a model I really like, the ABC learning design model. And again, this is an example of it, the bot that you can go and check out if you want. But here's an example of how you might use them. At each stage, every type of learning activity, you can think about how you might integrate and use these generative AI tools as part of them to design your, your courses and your learning. And last but not least, this is my favorite because this is the big picture, the community of inquiry model. This is about how you create a student experience based on these three kinds of presences, cognitive presence, teaching presence, and student presence, sorry, social presence. <laughs> I've reframed them as collaborator AI, analytical AI, and facilitator AI. 
So think about the tools you have, think about the bots, think about all of the different types of tools and how you can use them. How might you design your learning with that in mind? How might you think about leveraging these tools to create a learning experience that fits that Education 4.0 model? Because this is where we're heading. We've already seen the analog, we're coming through the digital, and I really hope that this is where we're heading, to the AI-informed, AI-enabled type of education that I think can really, really assist our students um, in this world that they are entering. And that's my last slide. This is really for the administrators in the room. These are things that I recommend you do in your network, in your school, and that you go back and you have a conversation about these steps and how to implement them. And that's me. Thank you.